Well, we've come to the last day and the last hour of the feast, and uh, I should probably share with you a kind of behind-the-scenes secret that those of us who have the privilege of speaking at Ligonier conferences have no idea who chooses the theme or who selects the particular topics on which each of the invited speakers will speak. There is some mystical group somewhere. <laughs> and the fact that when I listen to the chairman of the board, Bob Godfrey, he always seems to know so much about the topics that he's been asked to <laughs> speak on. I know if I asked him, he would, he would just bow his head with that wonderful humility he has, and the little smile would play on the corner of his lips, and he'd say, well, I'm a church historian. <laughs> However, whoever these people are, uh, they have learned one great Scottish tradition. I remember as a youngster how excited I was when we got the mathematics textbooks for the beginning of a new year, opened the front page, and saw those glorious words, the answers are all to be found at the back of the book. <laughs> and that's where we're going to turn this morning to Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to read the first five verses there. And uh, as you're turning there, I'm sure you would want me to say to Chris Larson and ask him to pass on to all the Ligonier staff our tremendous gratitude to them and our appreciation for the work that they have done behind the scenes. It's been one of the wonderful things to me as I've been associated with Ligonier that there are now so many people who labor anonymously for the promotion of the gospel and seek, uh, as the old prayer says, no reward save that of doing Thy will, and we rejoice together in that. So, let's read Revelation chapter 21, which I think is the passage to which that group of people wanted me to point you this morning. <laughs> then, says the Apostle John, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And as you know how the rest of this passage goes on, the coming of the new Jerusalem, as we look at the new Jerusalem, it's almost as though the, the picture seems to change a little, and we discover that the new Jerusalem is actually itself a garden and we realize almost immediately that what is happening at the end of the Bible is taking us back to where we were at the beginning of the Bible. And what is happening at the end of the conference is taking us back to where Steve Nichols began us at the commencement of the conference in the Garden of Eden with the blessings of God given to His people. And then the story that in a variety of different ways we've pursued throughout these last couple of days of how through the fall of the first man and woman, the garden was turned into a wilderness. And the people of God have found themselves ever since 
plotting their way through the wilderness in this pilgrim's progress to the celestial city through many dangers, toils, and snares, and how it is that God has encouraged them and helped them and given them the faith of which the author of Hebrews speaks to look for a city that lasts, that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. And so, in a way, it shouldn't surprise us that, as John writes, what he must have been conscious would be the very last chapters of inspired Scripture. He records for us this vision Christ gave to him of the future restoration of the garden, the future glory that awaits the children of God. And of course, he does this in a way that is different from other writers. He does this in a way that is full of pictures. When you think about the teaching of the New Testament and how the authors of the New Testament uh, give us, as it were, different angles on how the future will emerge in God's providence, John is the one who sees pictures. And those pictures, as you study the book of Revelation, you realize those pictures are a mosaic, and the keys to understanding the pictures is that all the pieces of the mosaic seem to come largely from the Old Testament Scriptures. It's as though Christ is giving him a vision of His purposes and their consummation in the understanding that John won't be able to interpret the pictures he's given because his mind has been saturated in the Old Testament Scriptures, and he will be able to see what is really there and therefore convey that to those of us who later on will read the Scriptures. And so he, as it were, is taken back here to the Garden of Eden, to the day when Adam was told to tend the garden and to nurture the garden. It seems fairly clear to me that the, the telos, the goal to which Adam's ministry is tending, is that this little garden he has been given as the image of God is a garden that he is to extend. He is to guard it because there is an enemy, and he is to extend it it is to extend from within Eden to the whole of Eden. It is to extend beyond Eden to the ends of the earth until the whole earth is filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And the tragedy that brings this world into the wilderness that the rest of Scripture describes and that we today experience. The tragedy of the situation is, as Paul says, not just that Adam broke the law of God as we do, but as Paul says in Romans 3.23, in the process, he fell short of the glory of God. He missed the mark of the glory of God. So here God has created this image-bearer, this, as it were, small version of Himself in a small world over which He is to be Lord, and called Him to work that garden so that as they walked in the cool of the day, they would be able to have fellowship in something that was common to them. And so, when Adam sins and Eve fails, and they are thrown out of the garden. The communion with God is broken, and under their very feet, the garden that they were supposed to extend to the ends of the earth becomes a desolate land, a waste land, a wilderness land, a land in which, as T.S. Eliot puts it, we are down among the dead men. And now at the end of the Bible, in this picture book full of symbols, unlike much of the New Testament, the watchword is not simply listen. The watchword is see, behold, 
look, what do you see? And this is not a matter of God saying to us, what do you see here? So that we go round the circle and say, well, what I like to see here is this, and what I like to see here is this. These are pictures interpreted themselves by the Scriptures themselves. And so, I want us to try and look at this amazing scene in Revelation 21 and 22 as though it were a a dramatic, great painting painted by a master, and in our own little way to be able to gaze upon this whole painting and to say to one another, "Do do you see what John means us to see here and here and here? Details, but by no means the whole. And if we do that, I think the first thing that we notice in this whole section is the marvelous way in which, by God's grace, these chapters describe the reversal of a past day, the reversal of a past day. The whole drama of Revelation is the drama that, in a sense, begins with the serpent. But by the time we are in the first century, the serpent has grown into a dragon, and the dragon has brought forth a beast, and the beast has brought forth together with the dragon a false prophet. And together this anti-trinity, this ungodly trinity, has brought forth an entire kingdom, an entire dominion an entire city that is hostile to God called Babylon. And the story towards the end of the book of Revelation is the way in which through Jesus Christ that city and the unholy trinity that lies behind that city will be systematically disarmed and systematically brought into its own wilderness a fiery wilderness in the burning lake of sulfur. And so, in these closing chapters, you see what happens. First of all, Babylon falls, the city of this world that stands against God. And then, in systematic order, the false prophet and the beast, and then the dragon. And we are left now in these chapters beholding the throne of God, occupied by the Father, seeing the Lamb of God in the center of the throne, and hearing the Holy Spirit towards the end of chapter 22, urging us to join with Him in saying to our Lord Jesus Christ, come, Lord Jesus. Come, says the believer, come to Me. Come in the skies and bring to an end the wilderness wandering in which we are engaged, and into this glorious future city that is described here in these chapters that are before us. And yet, as John had said earlier in uh, his first letter, all of this is here for us to see while we still live in a world which, as he says, lieth in the wicked one. And before we end, we have got to put these two things together, haven't we? The glorious vision of what God will consummate in the future, and the world we live in, which, as John says, lies in the evil one. And in the middle, in the meantime, the promise that John also gives us that the reason, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And I think in that respect, it's it's significant as well as illuminating to our imagination and our emotions to realize that the way Jesus reveals this to John, and must have wired John in such a way very differently probably from the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter, whose descriptions of the future events 
come to us in very different language, but our Lord Jesus wired John to be able to take the great motifs that were embedded in Scripture and understand what it is that Christ is doing in this restoration. And I think that's the reason why this is the story of the new garden that God is going to create. It takes us back to the story of the old garden, the story of the old garden where every tree was delightful to look at and its fruit looked delicious to taste. And Adam and Eve came to a tree identically described, and that's significant, identically described, whose only difference apparently between itself and any other tree in the garden was not that the fruit looked poisonous and ugly, but that God had said about that tree, do not eat the fruit of that tree, or you will die. And so, in a sense, every natural instinct in Adam and Eve looking at that tree, that tree said to them, I am beautiful, the fruit is delicious, eat me. And every natural instinct in them would respond to that tree exactly the same way it would respond to any other tree. The only distinction was that this was, this was God's call to them to trust Him and to obey Him simply because He was their heavenly Father and because He had said, this is the way, walk in it. And instead, they were enticed by what they felt and sensed about the tree rather than what they heard through their ears from the voice of God. They saw in that sense through their eyes instead of seeing the tree through their ears. And the whole story of the gospel tells us about the reverse of that how Jesus comes into the wilderness to face the tempter, who is now grown into a dragon because He has consumed so many, and conquering Him in the wilderness then slowly makes His way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, He faces the very same issue that Adam and Eve had faced, there is a cup that has been placed in His hands. This cup is the cup of experiencing being desolated by God. This cup is the cup of experiencing divine de desertion under divine wrath. And like Adam and Eve, but in radical contrast, there is nothing in this cup that Jesus can desire. There is nothing about this cup that would be attractive to Him. There is nothing in this cup that would say, drink me. And indeed, from one point of view, if Jesus had naturally desired desertion by God, bearing the wrath of God, it is scarcely possible that He could have been a holy human being. No holy human being could ever desire to be deserted by God. Of course not. But like Adam and Eve, but in reverse, God is saying to him now in the garden, my child, drink it simply because I am your father, and this is the way to the salvation of sinners. And so, every instinct in him in that unique moment in his prayer, the one thing he asked that it might be, the one thing in his Father's will he ever asked that it might be possible to be removed from him. Everything else in his Father's will he had an instinct for. For this, no human instinct would have been possible in his holy soul if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will. Isn't that interesting? 
He doesn't say, I don't really… I'm just pretending here when I say, this is not what I will. He is saying, in my holy humanity, this is never what I could will. But I do this gladly, willingly, not because of the thing itself, but because in the counsels of eternity, I have learned that this is the only way for sinners to be saved. And so, He drinks every last drop, beginning apparently when He takes the cup from His Father's hands in the Garden of Gethsemane, and you sense that the die is cast. And then isn't it interesting, I find it interesting, intriguing, although I don't think one can be dogmatic about this, but on the morning of the resurrection, as John uniquely portrays the meeting of Jesus and Mary in the garden, we have this little line in that garden that is full of theological significance, where we are told that Mary supposed He was the gardener. You, you feel the weight of that when you place that over against the story of the other garden, where the gardener had sinned and fallen and the garden had been turned into a wilderness, and He became, as it were, the wilderness man, and now Christ has come from the wilderness into the garden to drink the cup, to bear the shame and scoffing rude, to bear the judgment of God against our sin in the desertion of the cross, in the cry of dereliction. And now, in those early moments of the day of resurrection to step forward and by the first witness to His resurrection, to be assumed, to be the gardener. And that's what He was. He, he perhaps was the first person ever to say, this is one small step for a man, but a giant leap for mankind. Because in His resurrection, what Jesus Christ does is He begins to garden the earth. That's why He says to the, the, the apostles, now go into all the world under My authority and bring the power of fructification of new life to that world through the preaching of the gospel, and go to the ends of the earth. I mean, you would think there are eleven men listening to this who come mainly from northern Galilee, and He's telling them to go to the ends of the earth. The only possible thing that makes sense of this is that He is in the business of this great reversal of the past day, and He's inaugurated it. By His grace, you and I are beginning to live in it. And that's part of the picture that, as, you, as, a, as, a, as an art expert might point to a section of the, pre, of the picture and, and say, now you see all, how all of this is ultimately focused in the Father on the throne and the slain Lamb before the throne and the Holy Spirit who brings us the invitation. Do you see how all the little details fit into that grand picture? And that part of the meaning of what you are seeing here is that Jesus Christ is bringing the reversal of the last day. But then, of course, there's another theme that's clearly drawn in this picture, and that is that John is seeing through the eyes, through the lenses of Scripture in this revelation on the island of Patmos, he is seeing now forward to the glory of a future day. I had a friend, a, a seminary president, not Dr. Godfrey, but another seminary president who was leading a tour of the seven churches of uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and I said to him, are you going to visit the island of Patmos? And he said, well, no, we're not actually, because I spoke to the tour operator. I said, what about us going to Patmos? And she said, you needn't go to Patmos. There is nothing to see there. 
And I, I just said to him, tell that one to the Apostle John. <laughs> what, what we would be bereft of if John had not been on Patmos on this Sunday, this Lord's Day, perhaps not other Christians with him, not able to go to church, and coming out of this vision and feeling I have really been to church for the first time in my life and seen the glory of the Lord in this marvelous vision He's given to me of the glory of the future day. Now, as I say, this is variously described, isn't it, in the New Testament? And, and you realize why we have not only more than one gospel, we've more than one apostle, we've more than one letter. And there is, the, there is the dramatic way in which Simon Peter describes this, this, this conflagration that brings about the cleansing of the heavens and the earth and the emergence therefrom of the new heavens and the new earth. And, and the way in which Paul builds up that picture by speaking about Jesus as the second man and the last Adam and rising Himself from the dead, and then bringing about the resurrection of the dead. And then, as Paul says, leading the resurrected dead to the throne of His heavenly Father as their Savior, as their representative, as the second man and the last Adam, and saying to His Father, it is finished, here we are. We offer this resurrected, restored, renewed creation to you. That leads Paul to make the, the awesome statement, and then the Son will be submissive to the Father. Not ontologically, obviously, su submissive. He's been speaking about our Lord Jesus as the second man and the last Adam, but as the mediator, as our representative he will say to the Father, Father, I've finished it. Here we are. We offer it to You, and I lead them in worship of You so that God may be all in all. And this, this is the movie version of how God becomes all in all. As John has this glorious vision of a future day in which the wilderness will become a garden in which the city of Babylon will be replaced by the city of the new Jerusalem. And there's too much here to deal with just now, but one of the things that really strikes me about these two chapters, if you can kind of join John and look through his eyes, one of the things that really strikes me is how absolutely fascinated he is by what's not there. And I think this is because, I think this is a real lesson for us. We get so used to this world, don't we? It's why we need our assemblies. We get so used to this world, and then we are together, and we, we oh, we see the world with different eyes. And it's almost as though even the Apostle John has has been so tuned to ancient Babylon, to a world that lies in the evil one, that, that what causes him to gasp is what isn't here in this new world. Now, there are some of them that we, that we could guess, for example, in, in chapter 21, the fact that there is nothing here that is detestable or false in verse 27. There is no one here who is not in the Lamb's book of life. Or in chapter 22, verse 3, the fact that th there'll be no longer anything accursed here. In a sense, we, we could have guessed that, but it's the other things that strike him and move him and strike me and move me. For example, that there is no more sun and no more moon, and yet no more night. He's lived the whole of his life in that world order, and now he, he is in a wholly new world order that cannot be 
interpreted in terms of the old world order, perhaps can only be interpreted by analogy with the original creation. It, it must have been, I mean, by instinct. No sun in the sky, and yet it's light. No moon to light you, and yet it's not dark that you would need the moon to light you. And then the things that come very close to us, to many of us. For example, in 21.4, that there is no more death and therefore there will be no more mourning. You know, my friends, when you lose someone you love, the world passes on and often thinks that you will get over it, but you don't, do you? Um, my father and brother died fairly proximately to one another, and I sometimes put my head down on the pillow at night and cry like a baby. I cannot imagine what it is like to be in a world where there is neither death nor mourning, and no more crying. I, the non-Christian doesn't have that hope. If you go to non-Christian funerals or memorial services these days, in my experience, what you are likely to encounter either is stoic despair or attempts to be humorous in such a way that we can place to one side what has really happened. We talk now about so many things, but we are such cowards. Listen to a physician asked a year ago, is there something people need to be talking about in these days of COVID that they're not talking about? And he said very simply, yes, there is one thing, death but here there is no more death. I mean, part of us as believers, we long for death, don't we? And sometimes believers are just so weary of this world, they long to be away and to think that it would even be possible to have that longing. You just want more of the life, and no more mourning, no more sorrow, and then these beautiful, beautiful words that uh, John tells us that God Himself will wipe away every tear from your eyes. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Psalms or Psalms, anyway, it's the same book Bob Godfrey reads, <laughs> is Psalm 3.3. 3, God is our glory and the lifter up of our heads. And if you're a father, and maybe if you're a mother, you've done this. Your, your youngster has, has messed up, and they're standing in front of you, and they have the decency not to look you in the eye, and the tears are flowing, and you put your hand under their chin, and you lift it up and say, look at me. I still love you, but this that he should come to me as his child and say, Sinclair, let me wipe that tear out of your eyes. It is going to be the last tear you will ever cry. I, it, it, it stretches our imaginations beyond the possibility that we could ever grasp it, that the one who made the entire cosmos in His infinity, His majesty, His glory, His immensity, His simplicity, His holiness, should so want fellowship with us that He would come to us and wipe away every single tear from our eyes, and that in this place there would be no more night. And there's something else that's interesting here. John, of course, was brought up in Galilee from a fishing industry family, but we know he must have gone to Jerusalem frequently. What would he expect to see in the new Jerusalem? 
What dominated the old Jerusalem? Why did people ever go to Jerusalem? Because there was the majesty and glory of the temple of God, where the heart of God exclusively could be known, where atonement sacrifices exclusively could be made. Jerusalem and the mentality of the old covenant believer was absolutely dominated by the temple. And what he sees here is there is no more temple. And the reason is because everything is temple. You probably know well enough that the Garden of Eden is described in many ways with indications that it it is reflected in the tabernacle and then later on was reflected in the temple. But uh, here there is no need for that, and the reason there is no need for that is because here in Emmanuel's land, God and the Lamb are the temple. Everywhere is temple. Everywhere is church. Everywhere is faith. Everywhere is praise. Everywhere is access into the presence of God. Everywhere is luminous with the glory of God. And every eye is focused on the throne. And that's where the picture changes a little, doesn't it? As John sees the the new Jerusalem coming down and the glory of God beginning to appear, he sees that this new Jerusalem is adorned as uh, a bride for her wedding day. His Scottish weddings, incidentally, are very plain things. Of course, the minister goes to the door, leads the entire bridal party in, in a one So, you don't stand there for half an hour waiting for the bridesmaids and the groomsmen to, to troop in. But in the, in the congregation that Derek Thomas serves, in which I was once his privileged colleague, uh, they, had a, they had a way of doing things that uh, often struck me, that when all the wedding party was now at the front, and if you were the minister, you were standing beside the bridegroom. The doors at the back closed. The trumpets at the back of the church sounded. The doors opened, and the bride appeared. And just to let you into a little pastoral secret, I always glanced out the side of my eye to look at the face of the young man. And then up the aisle to look at the eyes of the girl. And the wonder of the face, focus of the eyes, said everything. It's like Mrs. Cousins' hymn from Rutherford's letters, the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. And that's That's the picture here, isn't it, of this glorious focus on the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here is part of the good news of the gospel for you. If you are a single man or a single woman, you will have a wedding day. And whether you are single or married, it is that wedding day to which your marriage or singleness points, that you and I may live exclusively in the here and now for our Lord Jesus Christ. And this, of course, is the third theme that runs through these verses. There is the reversal of the past day. There is the dawning of the glorious new day. And, of course, there is the encouragement to live for Christ in the present day. Because John's understanding of the gospel is like Peter's understanding of the gospel, that once we have seen this vision, the question that arises for us is, how should we then live in response to this? And you think about John on the island of Patmos, this glorious vision on Sunday, and then he goes to bed, wakes up in the morning, and it's Monday. And the vision's in the past and Patmos is in the present, 
and the whole world lies in the evil one. And the churches to whom He's sending this are little colonies of heaven, but they're little colonies of heaven in colonies of Babylon. And from the eyes of the flesh, it looks as though nothing has changed. So, how do we live in this world? And the great message is we live in this world as those who have seen the world to come, as those who understand where this world, first of all, came from and where it has fallen, and how the tragedy is that we have lost the glory of God. And the wonder of the gospel is that it's beginning to restore that glory, which means inevitably that the Christian believer will be radically different, modestly diff different but so different that the Christian church and the Christian believer will be able to cease the ploys of 20th century evangelism in trying to find ways of getting my questions to non-Christians, which was almost the necessity of 20th century evangelism for this reason that non-Christians were not doing what apparently non-Christians were doing in Peter's day, so that Christians needed to be ready to give an answer and a reason for the hope that was in them because non-Christians were driven to ask, why is it that you are so different from us? Why do we find you so strange? And in the way in which the 20th century church seemed to adopt the philosophy that the way to reach the world was to become as like the world, to make itself as likable to the world as possible with disastrous results both for the world and for the church. In a world of enormous comfort for the church. And here John understands in the privation he experiences in the challenges that these churches in Asia are going to experience, that the call is to wash their robes in the blood of Christ in chapter 22, to pursue holiness in the face of persecution, and to live unreservedly for Christ. And He gives this assurance that Christ will keep us and that Christ is waiting for us. I came over to the United States on Tuesday. I'd been waiting two years to do this. It was like being bunion under conviction of sin. <laughs> but now the journey began, and the first thing was my flight was canceled. <laughs> and then there was turbulence. And then I got to the airport and characteristically could not find my driver. And so I wandered around in the slough of despond <laughs> until eventually a ligonier evangelist angel <laughs> gave me instructions about the way to go. And my kindly driver drove me to the hotel. And my, I made my way in my heavy coat from freezing point in the highlands to 80 degrees in Orlando and staggered into the hotel and wondered why the nice lady at the reception desk didn't tell me the number of the room until I eventually found it on the key that she had put in my hand. And I made my way along the corridor to room 418, and as I looked up, there was a man standing and it looked as though he was trying to get into room 418, and I said, I cannot bear to, to go back down and say there was a man waiting to get into my room. And he said to me, sir, is this your room? I said, yes, it's my room. I opened the door. He said, let me help you in. He helped me in, and he said to me, if there is anything you need here, let me know. And he turned away. And as he turned away, I looked at the name badge on his coat, and it was Jesus.
and he was gone. And as I staggered into the room, I thought, that's exactly what I need. If Jesus is waiting for me, and if Jesus says, if there is anything you need, ask me, then all will be well. And He is making all things new, and we're being sent out now, are we not, to live for His glory. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the glorious pictures that Your Word gives to us of not only the world in which we live, but the world that is to come. And we pray that You will send us from this place with a renewed vision of the truth of Your Word, the power of the gospel, the wonder of Your presence with us by Your Spirit through Your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ the bonds of grace that we have enjoyed and strengthened, and help us, we pray, to live for Your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.